Good morning, everybody. Why don't you all turn over to Romans chapter 1. And this morning, we're only going to be in Romans chapter 1 and a little bit of chapter 1 and chapter 2. So if you remember, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about what a diatribe is. And I want to repeat um, that for you right now, the definition um, that Brad Jerzak gives. It is the form of vivid dialogues with hypothetical interlocutors. The orator cites his opponent's arguments and objections and then refutes them for their listener. And just as a, a reminder, we were talking about the possibility um, that the book of Romans, uh, at least the first couple chapters here, um, I can't speak to the rest of it, but at, uh, and from what I've seen, there's a, uh, at least a possibility that uh, diatribe is used in Romans, probably more than once, probably uh, several times. For sure, there's rhetoric. Uh, in Romans, and I think Paul uses rhetoric, as we saw before, throughout his letters, um, which is important to understand. Um, but diatribe is that form of rhetoric, I think, that might throw us off a little bit uh, from what we normally understand things to mean. Uh, last time, uh, before that, two weeks ago, uh, when we were done, we, we took it, uh, Romans 1 and 2, and we took it as... Uh, from a direction of judgment. And I asked everybody to go home and through the week, keep a journal of all the times they judge people. Did anybody do that? I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> yes, it was a, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be a literal go home and write down every time you judge somebody because you couldn't even do it because you're probably judging people and you don't even know it, right? Uh, it happens. I mean, like Rose just said, mine, I thought if I had one of those little composition notebooks that were this big, it would be full all the way through uh, because it happens all the time. We do it constantly. So it's not an, an exercise meant to draw us into some kind of legalistic thinking. It's, uh, it's something that thinking about it can be beneficial to you uh, in your growth as a Christian, your growth as a, as a, as a believer. And I think, uh, so this past week I've been, I thought about Paul even, and judging. And you think about who Paul was before his conversion, right? I bet you Paul had, uh, he had a mind to judge, probably a lot, because of what he was doing against the church. And so he probably continually was judging people based on what he perceived they were so that he could go after them. But then Paul uh, saw the glory of Jesus Christ, right? On the road to Damascus. And he uh, went away for a few years in the wilderness. Uh, Oddly, the same wilderness that Israel was in after they left Egypt, right? Kind of cool. But he went off for a while, and he learned some things, and he got some revelations uh, from God. And when he came back, you got to you know, wonder, how long did it take him to overcome his previous wanting to judge people? I'm sure it wasn't overnight. Right? He had to develop himself and develop the character and let Christ develop that character in him so that when he was around people, uh, he did that less and less. I'm sure he still did it because he's a human being, right? Paul was like us. We like to think of him as, you know, he was a great apostle, but we like to put him up here somewhere, right? And he might have been up here in his character development of Christ, but in reality, he was just like us, right? Um, uh, like I learned in a class I took, he puts his pants on the same as we do. He really didn't. 
because he didn't wear pants like we did. But if you're alive back then, he would have put his cloak on the same way as we do. Uh, and you think of the disciples from the time that Jesus called them out uh, until the time Jesus left them. Just read through the Gospels and, and look at the growth that they had into what they, uh, those that we have with the written record left for us, the growth that it took them to even sit down and write something like that and then realize, looking back, wow, that's the experience I had with Jesus Christ. How amazing. And then the, what developed into them. I'm sure if you had known them for their entire lives, you would have seen uh, growth along the way. And so exercises like that, they help us to, they help us, uh, they help us grow. You can't be afraid to think like that or do things like that. Um, they're necessary for our growth, really. So we're going to continue today and wrap up uh, with the diatribe um, and pretty much wrap up uh, with the seven ways that we can uh, use that from Mr. Jerzak's book, A More Christ-like Word, that we could use to read the scriptures. Um, and this, this was part of rhetoric, but I pulled it out because I thought the diatribe was really neat. Um, and so this morning we're going to wrap this up. It's going to kind of be somewhat of a review from last time with a, a couple extra things thrown in there um, and just a different way to read Romans 1 and 2 which hopefully you'll find uh, at least a little interesting, right? I found it interesting. So is there a dilemma? That's what the name of his chapter is, uh, the diatribe dilemma. And he has it as a dilemma because he sees it, uh, what, what we're going to bring out that he says, and then we'll go a little past that, he sees it as a dilemma for Christianity to look at this, these passages in this way. Um, and so before we get right into it, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, I'm thankful uh, to be here today. I'm thankful that I'm able to uh, have the resources to study your word um, and grow closer to you. And I pray, Lord, that the things that we talk about this morning, the, the things that I've read and looked at and I'm sharing with folks that they um, would dwell on them uh, for a little bit and it maybe see if it helps under, make the scriptures more understandable to us, more real to us, um, to get at the things that you have and that the attitude and the character that you want us to have uh, in this life. And I pray, Lord, that uh, these things that I've learned and the things that we learn here together, uh, we could dwell on them and help them help make them part of our lives as we live uh, among others to show the love that you have for the world. Amen. All right. So um, if Paul is using a diatribe in Romans chapter 1, then it might not be exactly what we think. The conclusion we have from it might be a little bit different. It's not outlandishly different, but it's a little bit different. Uh, if, if diatribe is used here in this, just these two passages we're looking at, and possibly elsewhere, and we miss it, or we don't understand what it is, uh, then we might make some errors. And the errors would be the understanding we get that Paul is trying to get across to us, or that Jesus, or that God is trying to get across to us. So Brad says the first thing is that we might accidentally quote the very things Paul is rebutting as inspired truth. So if Paul is saying something and we take it literally and say, that's truth, and Paul is trying to say, there might be truth in this, but this isn't the truth I'm driving at. I'm driving at something else. You might walk away with it and say, that's the lesson right there. That's it. Uh, the other thing you might do is accidentally ascribe anything Paul says that we don't like to his opponents. So Paul is trying to tell us something through the form of diatribe, and he's getting at the truth, and we decide, well, I don't like that truth that he's saying, 
So that's got to be his opponents. And what he said before that he's trying to go against has to be truth. So we, he called that over the over diatribe. Uh, and so he says we should at least be mindful of the possibility that what we have always thought could be wrong. Right? We should always be mindful of that possibility. Um, you know, we are growing. And as we grow, I think it's, for many Christians, it's that locked into, this is what it says, I have to grow and conform exactly to what it says. But the point is, as you grow in the Lord, eventually, you might see it differently. And so you realize, I'm growing now, and the scripture isn't necessarily literal like I always thought. This is what God was talking about, because I'm growing. You know, I thought, how many times do you read the Bible, right? You know, God, maybe God wants you to read something 10,000 times, thinking it's always one thing, but as you go through life and you learn, all of a sudden it sparks in your mind, that's what it was trying to say. So you, it's that experience of growth um, that we get as we read the scripture, but also as we live life. Because we live life right here on this earth, among the world. Uh, and so your experiences are meant to, if it's, it's done in the, the, the way I just talked about a few minutes ago, in, in doing those types of little exercises for yourself that you get from the scriptures, and you learn as you grow, and then you start to understand what it was saying. Uh, you know, uh, I read a book, and I was sharing with my dad the other day, you know, the man, it's Father Rohr, he says that most of Christianity wants the Bible to be a rule book, right? They just want to open it up, oh, that's it, there's the answer. Cut and dry, simple. But it's not like that. No. There are some things in there that are like that, but overall, it's not always like that. So let's get into this and see what we find. So we're going to start off and we're going to read verses 15 to 17. So if you have his book and you're reading it, this is not in there. Uh, some of it is, some of it's not, but this little part we're going to talk about with these few verses is not. Uh, Romans chapter 1, I'm sorry. Romans chapter 1. Then we're going to read verses 15 to 17. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So if you read verses 1 through 14, Paul spends some time, again, thanking them as he always does, but talking about how he's desired to come and see them. And so when he goes into verse 15, he says for his part, he's eager to preach the gospel to them in Rome. And the first thing to me that jumps out about that is he's writing the book of Romans to people who live in Rome who are believers. But he wants to go and still preach the gospel to them, even though he knows they are already believers. So there's more to the gospel than, than being a believer. And so in verse 16, when he says, for... When he says for, he's linking that whole conversation before to that verse. He's not ashamed of the gospel. And you would think, well, why would Paul have to be, what, why would he be ashamed of the gospel? Did you ever think that when you read it? I thought, why would Paul be ashamed of the gospel? I think this is more than a statement of go out and preach the gospel and be courageous. I think this is a statement of, these people all know something about me. They know something about my past. They know something about me now. I'm just a person. But I'm not ashamed to preach the gospel, regardless of who I am. Because, as he goes on to say, 
The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. I think he's talking to believers. Again, as he says in Philippians, you're being saved. The idea that you're saved, but you're being saved continuously, not as a salvation that Christ is in you, but as a salvation from this life as you grow spiritually. And then he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, he, there's a man named Peter Enns who I listened to some of his podcasts from time to time, and he said something recently that was interesting. Uh, that he thinks one of the main thrust of Romans isn't salvation. It's trying to get the Jews to understand that Gentiles can come to God just like the Jews did. Yes. Trying through the whole book to get them to understand they're on equal footing. So that's why Paul spent some time. I think the other part of this is he's not ashamed of the gospel because some of these believers are Jewish, or at least there's Jewish people around them trying to tell them they're on a lower plane than they are because they're Gentiles. And he's trying to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, even though I'm coming to preach to Gentiles, even though I'm the apostle to the Gentiles, I'm going to come and I'm going to preach it and show you who we all are in Christ. And then in verse 17, again, starting with the word for, or because, he says, in it, the gospel, the power of God, he says, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. Yeah, that's an odd thing, right? F through faith for faith. What does that mean? So for me to learn what that meant exactly, of course, I looked at some commentaries and I looked at some different uh, versions or translations of the Bible to see how they wrote it. And uh, even Mr. Mitchell. And as it turns out, Many believe that it's through faith. So through faith of the Son of God, I know I have salvation. And that's for faith. And the faith, that second faith, is my life. How am I living? I'm walking in that faith. And because of it, uh, it if I'm righteous, which Paul will spend some time later in Romans saying, we are righteous in God's eyes, walk in that faith, and grow. And so that brings us to the next thought Paul has, which is going to start in verse 18 and run down through verse 32. Now, I was going to read the whole thing, but I'm not going to because I'm not going to. It's, it's a long passage. We've all read the passage before. Right. So let's let's do some highlights in verse 18. He says the wrath of God for the wrath of God. Now, this is a continuation from 15, 16, 17 and before it all has to do with not being ashamed of the gospel. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. So at some point in the past, at some point right now, at some point in Paul's life, wherever, in whoever's life, God is, Paul is saying that God has made himself evident to them. God made himself evident to the world. At, even if you want to say in the distant past, so that it would get handed down and down and down and down and down, and it's evident to them. So it's evident to them now we have the scriptures. It's evident because people were telling them who had the experience. It's evident because we look around, we see creation. Um, it's evident that there's a creator. It's evident that there is God. It says that God made it evident. So now we go through the different things that men did or humanity did or didn't do. Uh, in verse 20, it says, it is clear, so clear, that they're without excuse. So if you don't get it, you're without excuse. When you stand before God someday, you're going to be without excuse. Right? I made it evident to you in some 
shape, form, way, or another. It was evident. It says in verse 21, they knew, though they knew him, that this is, uh, I, many people will say we're talking about, you know, people before the flood, uh, but even though people know who God is, even today, even though people know who God is, they don't honor him. He says they don't give him thanks and they become futile. Or as Paul says later in Romans, they become enemies. Uh, he says in verse 22 that there are wise, but they became fools. And then he goes on saying how they changed the glory of God uh, from the image that he was into the image of corruptible men. And he says in birds and animals, we're talking about idols and how they worshiped different things. And we could take that today. We worship other things besides God. We just do. Uh, and then he says that God gave them up, he said, go ahead, if that's what you really want. And that's what he's done, right? God isn't standing over me every day saying, I made myself evident to you, so you have to follow me and know who I am. He says, here I am. I'm evident to you. And this is all in relation to what Paul said about the power of the gospel. I made myself evident to you. Come to me. Like Jesus said at the pool of Siloam, come to me, I'm here. And if you choose not to, that's your choice, right? That's what he's saying. And he let them go. So then we read, uh, he gave them up to their impurities. They exchanged his truth for a lie. It says in verse 25 that he served, they served the creatures rather than the creator, uh, and then again, we'll start off in verse 26 and read down through. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. What do you think after you read that? Whew. That's pretty amazing, huh? So, this is not separate from what we just read in verses 15 through 17. Although in most of our Bibles, they have headings. And the headings tend to make us want to separate, right? Oh, this is one section. Now, here's the next section. Different thought. Same thought Paul has. Same thought. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I said something like, we're in Romans chapter 2, and I said, but remember, chapter 2 is not really a chapter. Chapter 1 is not really a chapter. All 16 together. One big, long letter, right? There are different thoughts, but they all flow together. So Paul has this thought, and uh, Brad takes this thought in a direction which I think is it has some merit to it. Brad brings out that there is a debate raging today, and there is. If you read anything about Christianity today, and you read blogs, and you pay attention, and you read books and things by Christians, there is a big debate raging whether paul here is talking about homosexuals or is he talking about pedophiles and the reason that that is brought out is because in paul's day 
In the Greek and Roman times, homosexuality was not uncommon. Pedophile or pedophilia was also not uncommon. Today, we take uh, being a pedophile as jail worthy, right? Rightly so. These people should be taken out of society. At that time, that wasn't the thought. At that time, especially among people who were in higher offices or had slaves and things, it was a sign of manlyhood. And, you know, you can, uh, you can look at that up. That's, that's common history. That's not just Bible history. That's common history. That was a practice that happened in those days. In fact, slaves were often sexually abused. And it wasn't considered abuse by the power structures. Uh, Brad brings out, uh, there's a movie, I can't think of the name, I've never seen it, but it's about that very topic that takes place today in Afghanistan and other countries. And so Brad brings up the idea that, you know, they serve Allah, and if they were homosexual, they would be taken out and stoned, but if they perform lewd acts with a young boy, it's a show of manliness. And so this still happens today in the world. In what we want to call the civilized world, we look at it as wrong, as should be. So there are people, and you can imagine who they are, who want to take that and make that only about pedestry and not about homosexuality, because they want to make themselves feel like there's nothing wrong. Honestly, as I looked at this, with, he, makes, he makes this out to be a huge part of this. And I guess kind of rightfully so, because Christians are preoccupied with sexual orientation because of the world we live in. There are all kinds of identity issues going on in the world today, right? with people. Am I a guy? Am I a girl? You can now get a complete sex change and make yourself into either one. And there's the things raging on because now they're allowing youngsters to decide whether they want to be men or women. Uh, all very disturbing, for sure. However, we miss the whole point. I, I feel like, because of conversations I've had with people, regarding this passage, that's where we stop. We stop at the part about men and women, men with men. But Paul doesn't stop there. Read the rest of it. There is not one person in Paul's audience that is exempt from what he just said. None. None of us are exempt from anything in this passage that he just read. Nobody. Have you ever gossiped? Well, of course. Gossiped? You ever gossip, Rose? I gossip. I, we just do it. We don't even think about it, right? We do it. And unless you stop and think about your day and think of all the conversations you had, you're like, wow, that was gossip. Well, according to Paul, the gossiping is just as bad as what he just talked about, sexual immorality. Just as bad. He says people who slander, disobedient to parents, uh, deceit, people who want to cause strife all the time, people who are greedy, evil. I mean, he, he puts it all together. We all fall into all of this. 
And everybody in Paul's audience, everybody he wrote this letter to is deserving of what it says in verse 32. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not just the people in verse 26 and 27, but all the other people. If you lie, according to Paul, because he lumps liars in there too, then you are in verse 32. Why is Paul saying this? He's writing to some people who are very, or come from a legalistic background and are legalistic in their thinking. And they, he knows, are going to be people who are pointing fingers at each other or at groups. If they're a Jew and they're a believer, they're way up here because the Gentiles are like all these other things. But me, I'm not like that. I have the law of God on my side, right? Even Paul said, blameless as to the law of God. Now I read that and I think, wow, was that diatribe? Was he trying to say something? This is what I am. But saying, this is not really what I am. And now I'm going to tell you what I am, right? You read that passage again now. But staying here, the things that are so bothersome to us, we make big things out of them, and we focus on them, all the while, all these other, what we would call little things, which aren't really all that bad, Paul is saying, yeah, they're bad. You commit these things every day. I bet you if Paul... When Paul finally met with these people and he's going through this letter and explaining things to them, he could have said, I do some of these things all the time. And we don't want to. Well, Paul would never say that. Last time we looked at this from an angle of judging. And when we... There's a, there's a line... There is, there is saying all of those things are okay, and so I'll just ignore it. Or saying to yourself, all of those things are wrong, and I do them too. So, knowing that, when I see the other person, now, just like Paul, I'm just like one of you. But I know something about all of that. And that's what he goes on to say in chapter 2, verse 1, which, remember, is not a chapter. It's a continuation of what we just read. He says, Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. I wonder if there were some people in Rome who were believers, who are either new people, who were like what we focus on in verses 26 and 27, or maybe had done some things like that themselves because they were part of some hierarchy in Rome. But as a believer, Paul is trying to bring them out saying, come on, I'm going to talk, talk about some things here. But he also says that you can't judge anybody because you are guilty of doing all the same things. And in verse 2, he says, you say, remember we looked at that last time. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with the truth. And isn't that how we think? If we focus in on verses 26 and 27, in today's world, Christianity, obsessed with sexual orientation, I know that the world is obsessed with it too, which is exactly the reason we should not be obsessed with it. We want to think that, oh, their judgment's coming. I guarantee you, across America today, at this time, 
in the different time zones, there is a preacher somewhere preaching about this and how they are deserving of hell because he's doing what? He's reading verse 2. I'll read it out of the NASB. It says, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But I just read it a minute ago from the NRSV, which says, you say we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with the truth. Because the NRSV sees this as diatribe. They see Romans 1, 18 through 32 as diatribe. It's not that it's not true. Those things are all wrong. They're all against God's truth. It's that that is not the point that Paul is driving to. The point he's driving to is, you say, anybody who does those things, God's judgment is in accordance with truth, and you're going to get yours. Why does he say, why might he say, (laughs) you say? He goes on in verse three, do you imagine whoever you are that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But by your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself On the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, for he will repay each according to one's deeds. Just the simple fact of someone looking at verses 18 to 32 in Romans 1 and pointing fingers at everybody else who's doing those things, you're despising God's grace. And God's forgiveness. And so you are going to be judged just like the rest of them. And I think Paul is saying, and for pointing the finger and saying that you're not like that because you're a human being and you are like that. In verse 11, it says, God shows no partiality. So it doesn't matter. Which of these things you do? I mean, we all take all of these things and we, we make a, 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 a piece of paper in our head and we put number one thing that God hates. Number two, number three, and we go down the list. And I bet you that we tend to put the things that we know we do way down at the bottom. These aren't as bad. Those are worse, right? And so all of our lists might look a little different. And Paul is saying... No, it's all lumped together in one thing. Yes. Yeah. What was worse? And what was not as bad? <laughs> Little white lies. And then we continue down in verse 12. All who have sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who will be justified. When the Gentiles, why does he point out Gentiles, because who he's writing to, many of them are Jewish believers. And like I said, they have themselves in a different plane from the Gentile believer. So he says, when Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts to which their own conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God, through Jesus Christ, will judge the secret thoughts of all. Everyone. 
So that, to me, can conclude the diatribe that we just read. And you say, well, what is the diatribe? I think the diatribe, in essence, is telling people or telling them, I'm coming to you. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I might very well be guilty of some of these things I'm about to read to you. But I know the grace of God. Because he knows what the cross was. I know the grace of God. So who is the imaginary interlocutor? Whoever it is. Because in this instance, they're not imaginary. They're probably almost every single person Paul's ever talked to about the gospel, right? Because they all say these things. They all list all these different things. And so in verses 18 to 32, I think Paul, in essence, is saying, forget about it. Get it out of your mind. Put it behind you. Because God's grace is what matters. And that's what he's saying in verses 15 to 17. Faith, your walk in knowing who God is and knowing what he has done for you should take all the rest of chapter one and put it way in the back, not only for you, but for every single person that you see. It should, because when God looks at them, what is he seeing? According to Paul, they're seeing, he's seeing someone who's righteous because God has made them righteous through the cross. And so why are you looking at them and listing off all these things saying, look at you. When you are, he says in chapter two, guilty of the very same thing. So what he wants to get rid of the diatribe part, what he wants people to overcome, it's not that it's not truth, but it doesn't fit into the truth that he's trying to get across. And the truth is, that everybody, everybody, saved, unsaved, believer, non-believer, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. They're all going to be judged, all of us. And it says that Jesus is going to judge the secret things of all, the secret thoughts of all. Nothing is going to escape. Sin is taken care of. Becoming the character of God or the character of Christ, which is what you do when you live from faith to faith. That is what matters. And that, I think, is what the diatribe is. And so knowing that, as you read through Romans, you begin to see. I mean, you can't read through Romans and get verse 32. can't. Because according to the rest of Romans, when you start reading about salvation, you read Romans chapter 5, it's gone. Verse 32 is gone. It's not a contradiction. It's rhetoric. That's what Paul is master at. And so there is truth in what he just said. But you have to take all of it together.